Hi everyone, and welcome to this introduction to the various styles, provinces of Northwest Coast art. So the Northwest Coast is commonly described in terms of three sub-areas or style provinces. These are areas defined by stylistic similarities of the art, but also by similar ceremonial and spiritual context for the art. So before I continue, I just want to note that using categories like this can be problematic. Art is influenced by localized practices and fluid movement of ideas and styles all along the coast. I'm using these categories to shape a general understanding of the region, not to make definitive statements about what ceremonial or artistic practices take place here or there. Um, you know, what belongs in one area or, or what doesn't belong in another area. So I'm trying to warn against essentialist thinking, this notion that art and culture from a particular region can only take place in that region and that any variation is somehow inauthentic or, or doesn't belong. So this can be the problem with categories. So I wanted to quickly introduce some of the, the differences in the art and the culture of the Northwest Coast. The goal here is to give you a sense of, of how Coast Salish art differs from the more northerly styles, which I think is the, the style that most people call to mind when, when they think of Northwest Coast art. So just quickly, um, looking at this map, the northern province or the northern styles can kind of be defined by the, the dark blue at the top, the Tlingit, the Haida in the red, and the Simshen speaking groups, the Niska, Gixan, and the Simshen. Um, the central coast is really everywhere else except for the green, which is the Coast Salish. So northern northwest coast art is typically concerned with social hierarchy and family crests. There's a defining style in the north in which two-dimensional painting, engraving, and shallow relief carving are based on a form line aesthetic. So this region is, is famous for its form line art, as you can likely see uh, the kind of familiar style in this, this totem pole by Bill Reed. Crests are a form of heraldic art closely associated with the potlatch system. Crests are closely guarded possessions. They are a legacy of the ancestors and they're acquired from supernatural encounters with animals or supernatural beings or events. Crests are to be held in perpetuity by the descendants of the ancestors who acquired them. So to display a crest or of another group is an insult to the integrity and the identity of that group. And for northern groups, a good example of crest art is a totem pole but of course, uh, Haida tattoos, as seen in this picture here, this drawing from 1870s. Nearly all Haida people were tattooed uh, with their family crests until they were pressured or discouraged from doing so uh, by missionaries. However, crests decorate many aspects of Haida, Simshan, Gixan, and Tlingit culture, uh, such as baskets and hats and robes and, and house front paintings, and of course, the totem pole. So it can be informative to think of crests and the totem poles that carry them as similar to European coats of arms. They mark specific family histories and statuses and roles and responsibilities, and they can't be owned or reproduced by just anybody. In the north, crests are depicted in a conventionalized style known as form line. Form lines are continuous flowing lines that turn and swell and diminish in a prescribed manner. They're used for figure outlines, internal design elements, and in abstract compositions. You can see the basic elements of a form line here on the right, um, and how those lines are represented in carving on the left. So the primary lines are usually in black, secondary lines are in red, and the tertiary are kind of usually blue-green elements. These designs extend to the limits of the field, or the limits of the object being decorated. All the elements within the design are in harmony or in tension according to a sophisticated aesthetic. Form line art also consists of a number of other style elements, the ovoid, which is a slightly squared off oval with concave bottom or contour, U-form or arches, um, and, and these S-forms, so U-forms on the left here and S-forms on the right. With these elements used with numerous variations, the possibilities for creations are almost endless. These are all uh, feathers and wing designs created primarily from form line, ovoids, U-shapes, and S-shapes. Now, art from the central region revolves around complex mythology and dramatic theatrical displays associated with the potlatch and with winter ceremonials. 
Up and down the coast, the winter was a time when people gathered and engaged in celebration, uh, ritual, and ceremony. In the north and central regions, these ceremonies featured crest displays on carvings, clothing, and architecture. Architecture, but also in elaborate masquerades and these theatrical performances where stories of family rights and prerogatives are reenacted. The Kwakwaki Walk are renowned for their dramatic arts in conjunction with the potlatch and these winter ceremonials. And the art of this region is heavily influenced by high ranking individuals displaying their crests and inherited dance privileges. Um, now, in the era after contact with Europeans, Kwakwakiwak uh, continued to evolve an exuberant, colorful style all of their own. And in the early 20th century, with, with uh, availability of, of different trade paints, they added orange, yellow, and green paint to their palette. Um, and this style is, is really well depicted in this contempor uh, contemporary uh, reimagining of, of Boba Fett by uh, Andy Everson. Now, North and Central art styles are very concerned about social hierarchy, lineage, and status, and the crest and strict rules of ownership reflects this. In the South Coast Salish, re which is the Coast Salish region, it's less concerned with social hierarchy. So painting and relief carving in Coast Salish areas uh, is more geometric, consists of circles and chevrons and crescents and T-shapes. The Coast Salish artists carve strong human and animal sculptures, on house posts, coffins, grave posts, spindle whirls. So Coast Salish um, do not traditionally carve totem poles. Uh, often they carve welcome figures uh, to a territory or, or figures that would welcome you into a house. So for the Coast Salish, potlatching and gifting are still very important, but carved monuments serve a different purpose, having both spiritual and social significance, often marking graves, or I mentioned this, marking graves and, and welcoming people to their territories or into their houses. Some of the most elaborate Salish wood carvings are on mat creasers, which are seen here in the bottom right, and spindle whirls, both of which are important elements uh, used in, in weaving. So although wood carving is highly developed in the Coast Salish region, basketry and textiles are, are a major art form. Wool and blankets woven from it functioned as a form of currency or wealth and, and still do. Um, and prior to the introduction of sheep to the region, wool was mainly obtained from domesticated Salish wool dogs. The dog hair was combined with goat wool, goose down, and plant matter like cattails uh, in the spinning process to make yarn. So a spindle whirl, as I mentioned, uh, is a disc fitted onto a spindle, which is that long stick you see in this image. Um, and it's used to spin fleece into a thick yarn. And it's often, the, the spindle whirl is often carved uh, from wood or stone, and it has geometric or, or human element figures carved into it. It's said that as the disc spun, the elements would kind of mesmerize the spinner and, and add to the spiritual and social significance of the textile being produced. So in the 1980s, a, a Musqueam artist named Susan Point initiated the use of spindle whirls uh, in, in a more contemporary Coast Salish art form. Her work has been a major influence uh, on Coast Salish artists ever since, and many of the works in the Salish Weave Collection continue this tradition of, of drawing on the spindle world for inspiration. <laughs> 